Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today, Dan interviews Patrick Yip, director of business development at AppMex. But first, Corey and I will talk about the U.S. government debt downgrade and 54-year low unemployment. And remember, if you want to tell us what's on your mind or ask us a question, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. (laughs) The pitch thing is a joke. Fitch ratings downgrading the U.S. government's debt is kind of a joke, no? Uh, I, I mean, I guess they're saying what everybody has has known, I suppose, <laughs> if that's the joke. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the joke, of course, is that they're supposed to be rating the creditworthiness, and they're saying that there's any chance in the world that the printer of the world's reserve currency might not pay its debts. It's like they're giving credence to this idea of these debt ceiling things where, oh, we're going to default on the debt. Like that will ever be allowed to happen. It's pure kabuki. I think this whole, I think if there's any credibility or credence or anything to Fitch, which is like, you know, Fitch is like the third tier, you know, they're, they're not exactly the, the big boys in the ratings business. If there's any credence to it at all, it's simply they're saying, well, they won't default, but of course they'll inflate away some value of the currency by you know, and therefore of the debt, making it less desirable, et cetera. Maybe that is it, but I, otherwise it's sort of a, it's like a stunt. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a ratings agency frat boy yes, stunt. Yes, uh, that's a good word. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what was on my kind of on my mind, a stunt. Like who was talking about Fitch ratings a week ago? Uh, you know, be- before this happened, yeah. nobody, right? And now all of a sudden, somebody that's right. called an agency points out things that are wrong with the U.S. government financial situation, which, you know, are all true, by the way. Um, you know, the, the, the parts yeah. about... You know, which is funny, like, you know, you saw the, you know, all the system people come out, you know, the next day and, and all be on the same page, like Janet Yellen and uh, Jamie Dimon, um, all like, this is, you know, this is ridiculous, uh, you know, blah, 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 you know, and Jamie Dimon saying, yeah, but they, you know, these are all things we've already known. Um, so. I don't know. In one way, I'm happy. Just somebody, you know, there's some attention being paid to the terrible, you know, debt situation of, of the U.S. government. Um, on the other hand, yeah, like I don't really know what to say about ratings agencies other than, uh, you know, they've historically yeah. <laughs> been, been overlooked a lot yeah. of other important things. So, right, um, yeah, make little of it. Yeah. Historically, highly pro cyclical, not counter cyclical. You know, they're never downgrade. They weren't downgrading, um, you know, mortgage related debt in 2006 right. or 2005. They waited until 2007, 2008. <laughs> you know, they waited until after, you know, um, Bear Stearns failed and after, you know, everything started falling apart. Oh, then we'll downgrade, you know. And so there's that. But also, it's what the point you raise is true. I think it's a stunt. It doesn't mean a lot to me, but I agree with it. It's true. You know, how do they even rate double A plus? How does the, you know, they went from triple A to they reduced one notch to double A plus um, in the ratings. And they cited a lot of stuff that you and I may have even talked about erosion of governance, rising general government deficits, general government debt to rise. Medium term fiscal challenges unaddressed, exceptional, um, sorry, exceptional strengths support ratings, several structural strengths underpin the US ratings, blah, blah, blah. That's the good part. Um, and then they get back into the bad stuff economy to slip into recession, Fed tightening, blah, blah, blah. So I can't disagree with the move, but it doesn't mean a lot. It's, it's a stunt. Agreed. Um, yeah, yeah I, I feel like we covered it. <laughs> it's just this. All right. So what was the other thing we wanted to talk about? Unemployment being its lowest at any time since I was eight years old. <laughs> 1969 was the lowest the unemployment yeah. rate uh, was uh, since it is today. 3.5% as of Friday. 
uh, the latest jobs report that comes mm. out about once a month. Um, not exactly indicative of a, a weakening job market, I would say. Uh, the, the rate was at 3.6% uh, the time before. So um, again, this people are paying attention to this because of the matters for Fed policy moving ahead and if the economy is weakening yep. or not. And you know, at this point, you would say no based on this number, even though the the jobs number itself for July uh, was a little bit less than expected. On um, under two hundred thousand was the expectation. It was one eighty seven. So, um, but somehow the unemployment rate went down. So, <laughs> go figure there. That's uh, some other discussion on how this yeah. stuff is calculated. But, um, yeah, I mean, right. to me, this means you know no reason for the Fed to pull back on any interest rate hike plans that they may have. Exactly. And last week I stumbled through that very idea and I was trying to say, I won't say what I said because it was confusing as I listened to it. I listened to it a couple of times this week. And all I meant is, is what you just said. The, the stronger the economy looks, the more emboldened the Fed will be to try to hit its target. And it will go after that target of you know, 2% on, we assume it's core PCE because that's the one they like. They'll go after that 2% target no matter what. And if it's core PCE stubbornly resists, um, you know, getting below four even at this point, right? Um, or four and a half, they'll, they'll go after it more aggressively. And when they see these, you know, all time low unemployment rates, they'll be, that's one of the main things they look at. That's their second part of their mandate. The first part is stable prices. Second part is lowest possible unemployment, they say. And, you know, this is <laughs> the lowest possible since I was eight years old. So, right. um, you know, yay, they're doing great, I guess. But, um, I think you're right. They will become more and more emboldened. And, and the stronger the results, the stronger the economy looks, I think the more likely they are to, to you know, exceed these little 25 bips hikes with something something more. 50 yeah. bips, 75 again. Okay. Who knows? Yeah, I wasn't thinking that. But yeah, that I could see that too. Um, it's, yeah, the, the, I mean, the unemployment rate is the thing that they're looking at now, you know, because inflation, the, Inflation numbers, while still high, have been coming down the pace of inflation, right? And so, and the unemployment rate is still, you know, going sideways, even lower. So, and another thing in this report is to watch is the the hour the earnings, right? The wages part of it, and that's that was at a four point four percent year over year growth, which is you know, a big thing for when you're looking at whether the inflation is quote unquote fight is working or not. Um, those are above the Wall Street estimates. So as long as wages are, you know, and salaries are going, uh, you know, they keep accelerating, you know, that, that growth keeps accelerating and unemployment stays low. I mean, the Fed has no reason not to, uh, at the very least, hold rates where they are. And then if not raise them, if you know, that rebound in inflation that we talked about last week shows up. So um, I think you're seeing some of this too, like in the market recently with the the bond yields last, you know, last week or up every single day. Uh, the 10 year is over, back over 4%. Um, so, and it was down at 3.7 like two weeks ago. So um, I think you're seeing some people more and more people wake up to that fact or believe it and or trade like they, they think the Fed is going to actually um, keep raising rates as opposed to anything else. Yeah, I um, but that I would say that's that's more recent, though, right? Because if you mix equities into the equation, <laughs> um, you know, so far. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. I was talking about At bonds, very, but yes, I mean, the stocks, yeah, yeah it's, it's, but yeah. you know, aside from the other day mm -hmm. when the Fitch thing came out and there's a bit of a tumble, I mean, overall it's, it's, you know, still like bullish trends for stocks. And I, where I was thinking was, you know, if we continue down this path where inflation is higher rates go higher stock prices keep going higher in the meantime like where does that end up i think it 
it, <laughs> uh, you know, the higher stocks go in the meantime, you know, the, the more I think the riskier things get, you know, as time goes on. Um, at the same time, though, it's all the trends have been pretty, pretty strong since last fall. So, yeah, but you're right about bonds, though. I'm just looking at the TLT, the 20 plus year treasury ETF um, at around 95 and basically erasing almost all everything it gained off of the bottom back in October. Almost. It's it's erased most of that. So it's it's almost like the market is saying, well, you know, we're gonna keep shoving stocks to the moon just cause. And um we're okay with this. <laughs> we're okay with seven percent mortgages. The housing market is okay with seven percent mortgages. You know, that structural um, demand and and I just saw the report of um, household formations are are surprising to the upside and of course certainly housing sales are doing that. I mean, people got to live somewhere, so they adjust downward. They buy, you know, they, they say, "Well, McMansion is out this year, but we need a place to live, and we'd rather own than rent." So I mean, and real estate's um, different everywhere, but anecdotally, you know, I have a neighbor like five mm-hmm. houses down who um selling their house didn't even like have time to put up the sign outside the for sale sign outside it was sold so like it's the demand yeah is there uh even though mortgage rates are are what they are i think anybody buying would maybe be banking on oh rates will go down at some point maybe i could refinance at you know some point down the road which isn't a terrible idea but you know that's i think rates still go higher personally anyway but um over the longer run so it's yeah people need places to live and it's not like again this just goes back i think this just goes back to all of these stimulus from 2020 and 2021 just like what the impact of it is 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 it's it's higher prices like that's yeah. <laughs> that's that's what that's what it is yeah. um it, it's just higher prices on everything for a longer longer period of time so I'm looking at the bank rate national fixed mortgage rate and the last time it was at right now it's 7.39% and you got to go back to 2000 23 years to get to that rate. I mean it's just been falling and falling and falling and falling and, falling and wham. And I remember I don't know if you remember um last October at the Stansbury conference, we had Scott Galloway um, was the keynote speaker, yep. really super smart guy. And he was saying that he remembered, um, I assume as a young boy, he's not as old as me, when mortgage rates came down to 10% <laughs> and everybody was everybody was cheering, the, you know, the American dream is still alive because mortgage rates are only 10% now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that was back when the um, dollar was yeah. probably 50 times more valuable too, right? Or or whatever whatever it may be. Yeah. Probably, yeah, that's so, right. But it's Sure. Yeah, 10% now would uh set back a few people, no? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it would set a few people back, but I still I continue to think those structural deficits are just, you know, the the shortage of housing versus demand. It it's um you can't get out of the way of it. It's like I, we were talking about copper last time because I had been to the Rick Rule thing and and sp- I had spoken about copper, um, which you can see the speech if you sign up for for you know you can get all the all the speeches on on video um, for the Rule Symposium oh, cool. and I'm I'm on there and it's the same thing like it's just inevitable you can't get out of the way of this essential thing that everybody's got to have. And there's a shortage of it, and the demand just keeps going up, and and they're both that way. There's a lot of that going around too, in you know, and and some of it COVID induced, and some not, some long term stuff, you know, in the commodities markets. So again, again, housing is super important for the economy, right? So this demand continues to be robust in the face of short supply. And it's just more stuff that the Fed can point to and say, see, we need to raise another quarter point, 50 basis points, whatever. You know, it, it, the strength is there. 
people talking about rate cuts are getting way, way ahead of themselves. And if they're bullish based on that and, you know, they're buying the kind of garbage in the stock market that reflects that type of view, you know, they're buying bankrupt companies like Yellow and near bankrupt companies like Tupperware. And this stuff is up like 500, 700 percent in five days. Um, you know, meme stock like Ascension is still happening among companies that are zeros. So somebody thinks some cuts are going to happen somewhere. And because you don't buy that stuff otherwise, right? Yeah, unless you're purely s- speculating, like you're betting on, like it's a game. That's the only reason you would you would do that. Yeah, yeah. Which tells you, again, something else about sentiment in the market, if you believe that. Um, it's still all that, that the right. kind of that bubble action is not gone yet when you still have people still push pumping these meme stocks. I mean, yellow trucking literally just went out of business. Um, their stocks having a great time because of, uh, the internet. So, yeah. And you know, the, the you look at the balance sheet and it's a four, the shareholders equity is negative $400 million. And you know, assets are overstated. The cash won't be there. <laughs> you know, this was a this is a a you know four month old balance sheet or something, and and the cash won't be there. So you know, it's even it's a 500, 600 million deficit versus liabilities. There's no way the equity has value. And Bed Bath and Beyond, it, it became official recently. They just got wiped out. You know, they said this is the plan, and the main <laughs> one of the main parts of it is we wipe out the equity. <laughs> And I promise you, somebody, some meme stalker, like the minute before Bed Bath & Beyond is delisted because it is a freaking zero and it still trades, uh, the minute before it's delisted, some meme stalker will buy it, think he's going to make 100x. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah, uh, there's, still, there's yeah. still a lot of that going on. I mean, yellow is a third of it's mm-hmm. owned by the government from the from 2020 bailouts. Sure. Uh, and yep. it's... The bubble has not begun to burst. <laughs> yeah, there's still plenty of air left in in the markets, hot air, and um, yep. maybe there always will be, but it's still there for now. All right, so we now we need to talk to somebody who's into something real, something tangible, something you can touch that has real value, um, and that, of course, is Patrick Yip. So um, let's talk to him about all things precious metal and coin related and let's do it right now let's talk with patrick yip (music) folks the potential as well as the possible peril of ai has captured the world's attention this year goldman sachs says 300 million jobs could be affected that's almost the size of the united states Others say it will create trillions of dollars in new wealth. In fact, it's already propelled one company to soar up to a trillion-dollar valuation just this year. And today, the global race to find ways to commercialize AI and turn it into profits is officially on. That's why two Wall Street legends, Mark Chaikin and Dr. David Eifrig, are teaming up for the first time ever on July 19th to reveal how artificial intelligence has just shattered one of the most important barriers in technological history. The one decision you may need to make with your money right now, even if you don't realize it, and why 2023 will be remembered as the year the great AI race began. With over 90 years of combined investing experience, there's nobody better to cut through the hype, answer all your most burning questions about what AI really means for your money, and help you find the real opportunities to position yourself to grow your wealth as this story accelerates in the months ahead. I urge you to tune in and consider what they have to say carefully. Just head to AIRaceEvent.com for full details. Again, Mark and Doc will go live on Wednesday, July 19th with all the critical details. You do not want to miss this. Head to AIRaceEvent.com right now to make sure you're on their list for updates. Again, that's AIRaceEvent.com. It's 100% free. Time once again for our interview. Looking forward to talking with today's guest, Patrick Yip. He is the Director of Business Development at AppMex, 
the largest online precious metals dealer. Welcome back to the show, Patrick. Hey, thanks again for having me on, Dan. Um, let's talk about a couple things today um, we do need to cover. One, of course, our listeners are probably as obsessed as every other normal human being with, you know, when does the price of silver go up? So maybe we should just kind of knock that out of the way and then get into the nuts and bolts of how people can buy silver because there are many, many different ways. So, uh, you know, if, if I if I was, um, you know, thinking about it, maybe when I was half drunk at the conference, I, was, I should have asked you, <laughs> wait, when's silver going up? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's a difficult question to start. And I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit to gold because I think silver, first of all, follows gold um, and gold being the, the predominant, most popular precious metal. My personal thought, too, and I look a lot back at history. I, I let the data speak for it, too. And there was a time in the 1970s, and I think there's a lot of parallels, too, to this point, too. Uh, in the 1970s, you had gold go from $35 in two that, or 1971 up to about $200. So it had a pretty big bull run. But something happened in the mid-1970s. And you know the Fed's been increasing rates a lot. Um, they got to a point when interest rates were positive um, for, for a brief period of time, and gold went down from 200 to 100. I'm sure you know this stuff, too. But what happened in, the, in that time, too, was the U.S. went into a recession. And then the Fed says, OK, well, we got to get the U.S. out of a recession. They started lowering interest rates. And then gold had this massive bull run from 100 up to 800. So, you know, getting back to today, what do I think is going to happen? I think we're in that period in the mid 70s right now where there's a, almost a lack of interest in precious metals. And we've seen it on our side, too. Obviously, 2020 up till, let's say, the beginning part of this year, demand was just crazy. And then in the summertime, you talk to any precious metals dealer and they would say demand has fallen off a cliff. But I think you're at that point when, you know, there's a lot of interest that, that you know, softened a little bit because people are seeing um, interest rates are higher. I mean, for example, I have an interactive broker's account. I think they're paying me four and a half percent on cash right now. Um, so, you know, it, and it's just sitting there. So I'm, I'm keeping cash there. I said four and a half percent is not bad for essentially, you know, a risk free return. So what I think is going to happen is is I think the U.S. economy will go into a recession. I don't know when. Um, I was talking to Jeffrey Christian at the conference, too, and he even mentioned probably in 24 or maybe even 25. But I think there's a point in time when the U.S. is going to go into a recession. The Fed's going to say, we got to get the U.S. out of a recession because that's going to be the, the number one concern with everyone. Right now, everyone's talking about inflation. I think if we are in a recession, people are going to be talking about job losses and so on, whatever happens. Uh, but I think when that happens... When, when the, the Federal Reserve starts reducing interest rates again, I think you're going to see gold um, run. And then getting back to silver, typically what happens in these bull runs is gold runs first and then silver runs after gold to a greater extent. So, you know, kind of dodging the question didn't really give you a, a number, but I, I, I think it's going to it's, it's going to be um, dependent on the Fed lowering interest rates and, and pivoting before uh, the precious metals run. Well, you and I both know, and and our listeners darn well ought to know, um, that you can't peg time or price. You can only describe the fundamentals. And, you know, you gave me some approximate timings, but they're just guesses, and we all know that. Yep. But thank you for that. All right, everybody, you're, that's, you know, that's all you're going to get on that. But um, <laughs> you, you alluded already to, um, you know, a presentation you gave recently where you talked about... Um, the fact that Atmex offers 30,000 different products and how the hell do you know which one to buy really is the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so let, let's, let's ask, now I'm going to ask you that question. Like what, um, where do you, where does, where do I even start? Let's just say I've never bought silver and I, re, and I'm really interested in owning it. Where do I even begin to understand which of the, you know, coins and bars and futures and stocks, you know, equity, like what, how do I figure out what's right for me? Yeah. So, um, as you mentioned, we have 30,000 products in stock. Um, uh, what I did on that, um, that breakfast presentation was I wanted to make people a better precious metals investor. Um, uh, and the, the reason I say that because we have, we're basically the largest precious metals dealer. 
Um, we've done, you know, 18 billion in lifetime sales, 50 plus mint relationships, you know, 2 million plus registered users. So the thought is, we believe that our data is indicative of the broader precious metals market. So, you know, we could get into, you know, if people are buying gold, or if they're buying silver, if they're buying bars, if they're buying rounds, if they're buying coins, we could get into the difference of this of those two. Are they buying the fractional sizes? Are they buying one ounce? Are they buying larger? Uh, are they buying bullion? Are they buying numismatic? Um, I mean, there's so many questions um, that, that anyone could ask themselves. And what was funny is, is at the conference, everyone's saying, hey, buy precious metals, buy gold, buy silver. But, you know, for a newbie, you're going to say, well, where do I start? So I think the, 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 the place where you start, first of all, is gold versus silver. Um, you know, if, if we look at our data, and this is year-to-date data in 2023, so this is relevant data. This is not old data. Uh, we've done over a billion dollars in year-to-date sales. But about 67% of our revenue dollars are into gold, and about 30% of our revenue dollars are into silver. So more than twice the dollars are going into gold. Um, What's the other 10? Um, it's, it's, so 67 is gold, uh, 30, 30% of silver. The, the other part is uh, your I'm platinum sorry. and your palladium, yeah. um, and your non-metal. So most of the people mm-hmm. coming to us are deciding to go for the precious metals, gold and silver. Um, okay. there's not, not a ton of interest in platinum palladium or, you know, we, well, we have a non-metal, we do sell, you know, copper rounds and stuff like that. Um, not a ton of sales in, into there. Um, I think there, there's a there's a variety of reasons people go each way. Obviously, you know, one of the reasons um, I'm bullish on gold is you just look at what's happening in the world. You have crazy money printing, uh, quantitative easing, and you, you look at it. How does the government get out of this? I mean, one is is they you know balance the budget. Obviously, not going to happen, right? Two, they default. Obviously, not going to happen either. Or three, they print. You know, so so I think they're going to go down that way too. Um, another thing you look at too is even central bank demand too. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that central bank chart, but Basically, they've been buying gold for um, probably, the, the, I think, the, the, the 15th or so consecutive year in a row, um, probably ever since the financial crisis, when, when the, the monetary system kind of changed and there was a lot more uncertainty in the world. And then you also have 2022 being a 55-plus year high in the amount of gold that central banks have bought. Um, I mean, a lot of reasons this is happening. I mean, one great example, too, is even during the, the event when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, uh, basically, the U.S. took Russia off the SWIFT payment system. And if you look at that, the dollar is supposed to be an unbiased world reserve currency. It's supposed to be the currency everyone wants. You know, it's not supposed to be the U.S.'s agenda, but, you know, we're clearly weaponizing the dollar over here. And, and if you're Russia, if you're China, if you're Brazil, if you're any of these BRICS countries, you're going to say, hey, I want to do what's best in my interest. Um, so I think a lot of people are seeing that. And, and that's why I think a lot of people are, are leaning more towards gold and silver. All right. Um, I have a I have a concrete question uh, just m- for my own selfish purposes. Sure. Um, w- what is the difference? Like I buy these silver rounds that look very generic to me, you know, the sure. one ounce silver, silver coins. Uh, um like, what's the difference between that and, um, I don't know, pick, take your pick, like silver eagles, let's say. Is there, a, is there a, I mean, I just, I want to buy an ounce of silver, man. What's, yeah. what, what's the difference with all these different ounces of silver? It, it's confusing. Why yeah, do they it, exist? It, it is confusing, especially for people who, who I feel like I, I, I live and breathe this stuff every day. And it, it's almost just firsthand knowledge for everyone in the industry. But there's basically three types of products. There's coins, there's bars, and there's rounds. So what a coin is, is is minted by a sovereign government. So think the the silver American eagle, the gold American eagle, you know, the, the gold and silver Canadian maple leaves, the, the gold South African Krugerrand, the you know, the the gold kangaroo from the Perth Mint. Those are coins uh, minted by a sovereign government. They often have a uh, like a, a face value on there. So the U.S. Gold Eagle has a fifty dollar face value. Obviously, it's not worth fifty dollars, but it, it with any coin minted by the government, it, it has to have a face value. It often has a year in it. And they typically have a little more detail than the other products. So that's the first thing. That's a coin. Um, a bar is typically rectangular in shape, and they're minted by a private mint. So just on the gold side, too, some of the most popular bars are the Credit Swiss gold bars, the Pamp Swiss gold bars, um, the Atmex gold bars are also very popular, too. But what they are is they typically come in a plastic card, which they call the assay card. And the assay card shows the the refinery has a refinery signature, shows the um, the, the, the purity, shows the weight. Uh, but these are minted by a private um, company. Um, so they don't have the details um, like a coin. So it's not going to be as detailed as, as a Canadian maple leaf or a South African Krugerrand or a gold eagle. Um, 
And then lastly, the, the thing is we could get into rounds. And what rounds are, they're minted by private companies. So this could be, you know, it could be Sunshine, it could be Silvercat, it could be our own private mint, Nine Fine Mint. Um, and the, these are, you know, it's basically you're buying silver or gold for the weight. Um, the, the, the downside about some of the rounds too, and, and we could get into what people are buying too, is, is let's say take the Buffalo round, which is the most popular silver round. You could have a Buffalo round minted by Nine Fine Mint, Sunshine, and Silvertown. And guess what? They're all going to look a little bit differently. Uh, so when buying rounds, I would say one of the most important things you need to be c- concerned about is are you buying from a good company that's going to be buying these rounds from directly from the mint, directly from the source, uh, and not just an individual because it's hard to authenticate a round because they're they're all different as opposed to a coin or a bar where they're all all consistent. All right, good, good answer, and you know it makes me want to just buy the coins now and never the rounds again. <laughs> but we we can what, get into what people are buying too if you're interested to see. see that's see what I was going to ask. What are people buying now, and why do you think? Yeah, so starting on the gold side, uh, what we see, and, and like I said, this is year to date data over a billion dollars in retail sales. Um, about sixty two percent of the the dollar value on gold are going into coins. Um, so the majority of the people prefer coins, and about thirty five percent of the the dollar value is going to into bars. Um, and if you look at rounds and the other products, basically about two percent. Uh, that's the gold side. So what I think is is people who are buying gold want almost like the best. They want something that's highly recognizable, highly liquid. Um, if you see, if you ever ever held a gold eagle, you know what a gold eagle looks like. You're going to be a- easily be able to tell, you know, if it's real or not. And then shifting over to the silver side, it's a little bit different. Um, coins still um, by far are the most popular. So about 48% of our year-to-date sales are coins, so, so almost half. Um, 31% is the, uh, the bars, and about 20% is is the rounds. So, so rounds are, are the least popular in the silver side. Uh, bars are kind of in between, and coins are, are, are you know makes up about half of the demand. I just realized like when I talked to you – in my, in my mind, you're like my silver guy for some reason, even though you, you know, <laughs> your firm obviously, you know, deals a lot in gold. Um, but I, I'm not sure where I got that idea. I think it's my personal obsession because I've sort of made my peace with the dynamics of silver. Sure. You know, if you look at, if I look at a long-term chart, it practically goes sideways and then you get these enormous spikes and I'm like, dude, I'm going to be around for the next spike because I think it's going to be a doozy, you know? Yeah. So that, that's why I keep hammering you about silver. It's like, yeah, and, and we could get into even another thing we co- covered in, in the presentation is even the types of silver people, like the, what the products people are buying too, because a lot of times, like I mentioned, the, the majority of people are buying silver eagles too, uh, or, or yeah. silver coins. And we could get into the percentages of what people are buying too, um, silver eagles, silver maples, if, if you're interested in that too. Oh yeah. What, what do they buy more eagles or maples? I mean, it's, it's yeah, so, supply so, driven too, right? I mean, yeah. So, so it, and it, silver eagles brings up another important point too, and we could address premiums too which they have been falling too but if i look at at silver coin sales so this is just year to date once again um 38 of our silver coins are silver eagles so you know once again by by far the most popular silver coin is the silver eagle um next is a silver maple leaf so this makes up 14 percent. so you know let, let's say a little less than half ish or so of the silver eagle demand is silver maples um and then from there you get 90 90 silver coinage makes up 11.4 percent so this is the coins minted before 1965, um, U.S. coinage, which is 90% silver, 10% copper. Um, from there, you got Morgan dollars making up about 5% of, of the demand. But I think the important part about um, when you decide to buy a silver coin is, you know, my thought is, let's say you wanted to buy a couple thousand ounces of silver, right? Um, you want to go into an eagle, you want to go into a maple, you want to go into one of the common silver coins. Um, obviously, you, if you're buying five ounces, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I'd be a little bit cautious with e- even some of these people promoting like, hey, I got a great deal on uh, silver Krugerrands and they're only $3 over spot. And you might think it's a great deal. But if you look at our sales, only 2.4% of our silver coin sales are Krugerrands. So you know, if you have a few, if you have 100, you have 200, not a big deal. You could liquidate it. But let's say you wanted to buy 5,000 ounces of silver. You don't want to put it all in silver Krugerrands because when that when it comes time to sell, someone might say, hey, I, I like silver Krugerrands, but I don't need 5,000 of them. Whereas the silver eagles, silver maples, you're, you're going to have plenty of dealers that would scoop this up. Same considerations as securities markets. Large liquid traders uh, are the safer bet. Yep. 100% agree there. Yeah. even Maybe even more so. Um, well, that's good to know. 
we could get him into, into premiums too. I mean, that, that's another thing that people often ask me too on, on Silver Eagles is, is anyone who's who's followed the Silver Eagle prices know that that premiums have just gone crazy and, and they are going down right now. Um, we could talk about that if, if you're interested. Okay, I am, but, I, but I've got something else on my mind yeah. here. Um, you know, you talked about coins, rounds, and bars. Um, can you like paint a hypothetical picture of you know, an investor who ought to buy, you know, coins, an investor who ought to buy bars, like why, maybe a better way to go at this is just to say, why would I ever want to buy bars? Sure. So I, I think it, it's different depending on, on if, if you're going on the gold side or the silver side, we'll start with the gold side too. So, you know, let, and I'm just more focusing on a larger investor, obviously a smaller investor, you could buy coins, bars, rounds, doesn't really matter at this point, because it's going to be easy to liquidate a handful of these. But let's say you had um, let's say you had a million dollars. Um, so you, you're you're a deeper pocketed investor. You want to go into gold. Um, a lot of times the, the question comes: Do I buy small gold? So on one end you could go fractional, like ten ounce gold eagles. The other hand you could go like kind of mid size, one ounce gold eagles, one ounce gold maples. Or on the the other side you could say I want gold kilo bars because I'm going to get more gold for my money. Uh, because the, the the thought is the premiums are going to be cheaper on. The gold kilo bars, and just for an example, you might be able to get a gold kilo bar for let's say under ten dollars um, over spot per ounce. Um, if you look at a, a one ounce gold coin, depending on what it is, um, let's say it's it's four or five percent over spot, and, and I use that number just because Atmex is an authorized purchaser from the U.S. Mint. We currently pay three percent um, over spot for for the coin. So let's say let's say gold is $2,000. Um, we're going to pay 2060 for that coin. And then we have to sell it above there. Um, so let's say you're, you're going to pay, let's say four or 5%. And then on the other side, on the fractional side, you're going to pay um, north of 10, 11, 12% in the, uh, for a gold eagle. Because we, like I said, as an authorized purchaser, we pay the US Mint 9% over spot for uh, a, a one, one tenth ounce gold eagle. So obviously we have to sell it above that. Uh, so the thought there too is is you know do you want more gold do you want you know you know i guess a smaller fractions there's pros and cons of each one obviously the the fractional gold if you wanted a couple hundred dollars of liquidity you could sell one or two coins you got it um on the large side like i said the premiums are by far lower than the one ounce coin um you're going to get more ounces but the, the downside about it is obviously if you want to sell a kilo gold bar guess what you're liquidating you're li liquidating a sixty thousand dollar product so if you wanted ten thousand dollars good luck you can't get it uh, but if we look at our data too, uh, about 63% of our sales are one ounce gold coins um, uh, in the gold side. So a lot of people, despite having, you know, let's say that million dollars, they're going to look at that and say, okay, well, I lose flexibility if I get the kilo. And, you know, the, the one ounce is kind of the best of both worlds. You know, you're still talking north of $2,000 um, an ounce when you when you pay the retail premium for a gold coin. Um and then you know, so, so I think I think it's a, it's a you know one ounce works there. Um, the silver side is is a little bit different. I know you asked about silver too as well. Um, so if we look at you know the fractional versus the one ounce versus the large, um, about fifty forty nine point four percent actually according to my chart is one ounce products, um, and the other half of it um, is if if I look an another roughly. What is it? Forty six percent is is bars over ten ounce. So, so basically, like like uh, or bars over one ounce. Sorry. Um, so larger silver bars. And personally, my thought is, if you had if you had a large um, amount to invest, let's go back to that million dollar example too. If you're buying coins, um, it becomes bul very very bulky. Like anyone who's had a, a silver eagle box knows that it's pretty large. It's like a shoe box. Uh, it takes up a lot of room. Um, whereas if you had 100 ounce silver bars, they're a lot smaller. So I think a lot of these these deeper pocketed investors go towards that 100 ounce silver bar. And personally, that's what I like too. Um, it's it's a nice you know nice uh, quantity of silver without being too large. Obviously, you know silver is about 25 dollars a day. You're talking maybe 2700 dollars for a 100 ounce silver bar. So you don't lack the liquidity um, with with let's say a kilo gold bar, but it's also small and compact. Does that help? Right, so. Yeah, yeah. So you talked about you you were ready to talk about premiums when I made you talk about that. So <laughs> Sure. So what what does drive premiums? It's I thought it was a simple sort of supply and demand kind of function. So the the, the premiums are largely a factor of the the, the supply chain. Um, so the price of silver is obviously geopolitical, macroeconomic conditions, but uh, what's happened in the last couple of years too is 
Um, anyone who's followed the, the precious metals market would remember the 2011 and 2012 run up in the precious metals where, where gold was 1900 silver was almost $50. Um, and then there was kind of a soft period between 2013 and 2019 where metals essentially didn't do much. Um, you had gold flatlining, silver flatlining. And what happened in the industry, like any other production facility or any other company, if you saw a demand normalize from 2013 to 2019, what are you going to do? You're going to turn off some of your machines. You're going to right size your staff. You're going to staff and, and get things ready for the production level you're going to see in 2013 to 2019. And then what happened in the pandemic is demand on the retail side doubled. So demand doubled. So supply chain now was right sized for this 2013 to 2019 time. So you had a lot of mints um, starting to allocate products too. So like, let's say the US Mint, they only make X number of coins every single uh, month. They then say, hey, Atmax, we'll allocate some to you. We'll allocate some to Dylan, Amar, CNT, whoever their, all their authorized purchasers are. And everyone wants more coins. Um, so we said, we said, hey, US Mint, we'll buy everything that you're willing to sell us. So we buy it all, but then we, we still need more coins. So we then reach out to our wholesaler network and say, hey, wholesaler, we want your coins. And they're saying, okay, well, they're, they're not selling for the, the 235 that the US Mint is charging us. Um, they're selling for $10 over spot. So then we're buying them at a higher price from the, the different uh, wholesalers, which is causing the premiums to go up. Um, which, you know, at, at some point, we, I think we paid north of $10 at one point um, from, from, a, from a wholesaler to buy some of the stuff. But, you know, premiums are going down, too. And, and one of the things I, I cautioned people at the conference, and it was kind of funny just looking at my data, um, I prepared my graph uh, or my presentation back in June. So a couple of weeks before the, the, the conference over there in July. But what I was saying is premiums are going to go down. You don't necessarily want to get a Silver Eagle when the premiums are high. And my numbers I had was $25 Silver, $14 premium, so $39 Silver Eagle. And then I said, let's say you're right, and Silver goes up. So Silver goes up from 25 to 30 but premiums normalize. So they went down from 14 to 5 where they historically have been. Your $39 Silver Eagle is currently worth 35 And obviously, this data is outdated now. Um, it, was, it was done about a month and a half ago, and, and premiums are falling. They're now about $9 over spot for um, Silver Eagle. So that's one thing I just cautious people is, is watch out for the premium. You want to bet on the spot price. You don't want to bet on the premiums because unfortunately, you know, premiums are a function of supply and demand in, 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 the, in the supply chain. And you know, I think they will go down over time. I think they'll, they'll eventually hit that, let's say that normal level of $5, which is what we saw prior to 2020. So, but, but at nine bucks, people are still... People still want silver. It sounds like they. I, I feel people like were still buying. I, I, I personally was not buying at that. Like I, I like the twenty five dollars silver price. I think long term you'll be fine. I just don't like that fourteen dollar premium. And even today at right. at nine dollars, I still think it's 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 high compared to what it has been historically. So, to avoid that premium, can I just you know buy an ETF that holds silver? So I would there's there's a couple different ways you could do that. I mean, one is is an ETF. Um, I would say be cautious of what ETF you're buying, um, and and not to uh, obviously the GLD and SLV are, are great for certain investors. But if you look what happened in 2022, I think the GLD lost about three billion dollars in, in AUM, and the SLV lost about 1.5 billion dollars in AUM. I don't know the exact reasons. There's there's a whole bunch of speculation where people say, hey, is the metal there? I know for a fact, if you look at the prospectus, that it is not insured, um, which is kind of a, a you know a concern to me. It's like, if I can't hold it, I at least want it insured, right? <laughs> at a bare minimum. So, you know, and, and ETF is one way out too. Um, I think if, if you want to stay at, at the physical side too, I would say the best best way to avoid some of those high premiums, once again, is to get into those 100-ounce silver bars where you're paying a $3 premium um, instead of a $9 premium. Um, another way I, I do is through one gold too. Is, is So one gold basically buys the 1,000-ounce silver bars. So these are currently selling for about $0.30 cents over spot on the wholesale market. And then we buy a lot of these in one gold. We store it in our various vaults around the world. So Canada, UK, um, US, and, and Switzerland. We then make the metal available for sale. And we sell it for 50 cents over spot. So we're only making 20 cents an ounce, uh, but it's a volume game. We've done over a billion dollars on one gold in transactions since we launched in 2018. But I personally said, hey, I could get into one gold. I have ownership in silver right now um, at an ultra low cost of so 50 cents over spot. And I'm waiting for those premiums to go down. So when silver eagles are back to $5 um, and, and not nine where they currently are right now, I'm looking at, at 
using the one gold's redemption option where I could swap my silver at one gold for physical in my hand. So, you know, it's a way to to get the exposure to silver, but avoid the premiums for now. Wow. Okay. So that also kind of answers my previous question too. Like, why would you ever do it one way or another? And one reason is to avoid premiums, <laughs> you know, yeah. which are, and, and you which could are listen to, still high. Say, say that again? Which are still high. Yeah. And, and you could you could ask any of the other bullion dealers too. I think even even Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin mentioned that like, hey, you, you could hedge metal, but you can't hedge premiums. And, and, you know, if, if a dealer like him and obviously a dealer like us too are, are concerned about premiums, you know, maybe as a retail customer, you need to watch out for premiums too. Don't just buy just because you think that silver is a great price. You know, make, make sure you're buying the right product yeah. at the right premium. Oh, I've seen people really get upset when they knew what was going on and they, they, did, they didn't know it before they started buying. Years and years ago, I won't mention any names, but there was a fellow who was rather apocalyptic about the uh, Y2K thing. And he was telling people to, among other things, buy those 10th ounce coins. And like you can imagine some guy with thousands and thousands of subscribers yeah. says, buy these coins that hardly anybody gives a crap about. And there's hardly, you know, they're not like around maybe at that time. Sure. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the premiums go through the roof and it was a big fiasco, you know. So I'm just glad that we're even bringing up the topic of premiums. You know, there is a premium, folks. You you don't get to pay the price of silver. You pay the price of silver plus the premium for the product that that dealer is asking. So make sure you know exactly what that is in terms of dollars and percentages and things in whatever form you buy. And, and you know, Patrick has just given you an incredible uh, way to get around that and pay really just pennies. It's It's you know, and get the exposure. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. I think, you know, if there's one takeaway from this interview, <laughs> um, I hope folks wrote that part down. <laughs> I, I would just say as someone who works in the industry, it, I could tell you if I'm buying uh, physical gold right now, I'm buying gold maple leaves. I mean, and this is, this is just what's right for me, not saying it's right for you. I'm buying one ounce gold maple leaves on the gold side. Silver side, I'm buying 100 ounce silver bars just because the premiums is lower. And if those premiums are still too high for you, I, I also have a one gold account where I'm primarily buying silver. Okay, so Patrick, why are they right? Why are Maple Leafs right for you? I just, I, I've always, I've always had, I like the 24 karat gold. And, and what's funny is my first gold coin was actually in 1988 Maple Leaf. So my my dad was actually, my actually my dad's, so my grandfather in Hong Kong was in the gold and silver uh, business. He had a small uh, retail shop out there. Uh, but my first gold coin, like I said, was an 88 Maple Leaf. And I just had a connection to the Maple Leaf. I do like the 24 karat gold. So that's personally what what I like. Uh, Eagles are also great as well. Um, I also do own Eagles too as well. But I, I do like Maple Leafs a little bit better. That's interesting. The first gold coin I ever heard of, I was probably in my 30s already, was Krugerrands. Okay. And I just, I have an affinity for them. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I mean, I don't own thousands and thousands of them or anything. So I, I, I own what I believe is a liquidatable amount. Yeah. Um, and, it, and I would say it, 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 and for, for the gold side, I was like, you can't go wrong with Eagles, Maples, Buffaloes, or Krugerrands. I think those are, those are the top four products by popularity. Any dealer would buy that stuff. Um, like I said, just even on the silver side, you don't want to necessarily buy a lot of, you know, and great coins, but I, I don't want to, you know, just bash them. But, you know, let's say you're buying a couple hundred ounces of gold. You don't really want a hun couple hundred ounces of Philharmonics or, or kangaroos or something like that. It's just when it comes time to liquidate, it's going to be much harder than if you had those four, the Eagle, Maple, Buffalo, and, and Kruger and. All right. Let me hit you with something else here out of the blue. You mentioned earlier um, when we spoke, when we first started this interview, you mentioned copper rounds, which I didn't even know existed. So the, this is this is how, how much copper in a round? Yeah, so, so we we sell copper by by the ounce or by the pound. Uh, it's to me, it's more of a novelty, and, and the reason yeah. for it, I don't even know what copper is trading for right now. I think like probably four bucks or something like that at four, a pound. Four -ish, I, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, I don't I don't know off the top of my head. It's not a market I, I follow too closely, but. You know, when when anytime you make um, a, a product, especially a commodity, into like a, a, a smaller unit too, so you're thinking four 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 dollars a pound. If I make it into a round, that's now one ounce. I mean, it's not one troy ounce; it's just one one normal ounce. Uh, it it just becomes expensive in terms of buying it, buying copper. 
my analogy too is like you, just, you let's say you go to, you like coffee and you go to Starbucks and I don't know what coffee's trading for but let's say it's it's three dollars a pound or something like that if you went to Starbucks and say hey give me a give me a some coffee at three bucks a pound they're gonna say you're you're you know they'll look at you just weird just they'll be like what what are you thinking right not happening yeah. so no. you know it, it, copper is more of a novelty that we sell uh, people like collecting things we have a whole ton of different copper rounds I don't know a ton about them uh, but I know people get it um, just for the novelty factor. I think I do have a, a copper bar somewhere in my desk over here at, at work somewhere, but you know, it's just more yeah, of a novelty so, thing for fun. Yeah. So if you're bullish on copper, you know, just buy Freeport stock or something and don't, don't, don't <laughs> buy copper rounds. It's, you know, yeah, there's, like there's a better way to get into copper than, than the physical copper. Actually, just, just a funny thing is, is I believe the, the melt value of 1982 and before copper pennies is actually north of two cents. Obviously, they're they're illegal to melt down right now, so I'm not suggesting that. But if if the U.S. ever went away from pennies, that then you could essentially double your investment risk free uh, by melting down these pennies, which you know, like I said, currently illegal, so don't do that. But um, if they ever if they ever get rid of the penny, all right. Now tell me, tell me what you know about some of the more exotic precious metals, which which are available in some form or another, platinum. Um, palladium rhodium yeah I, I don't know a ton about them i just know that that we do sell them um they are not not by not the top products that that people are buying i mean i'm just looking back at my my data over here one and a half percent of our our um year-to-date sales is platinum 0.2 percent is palladium so uh, they're largely an industrial metal i would say that there's probably a better way to speculate on that uh, another thing too with, with and we talked about premiums too is when you get into some of these these more niche metals so outside gold outside silver make sure you look at the bid ask spread so so dealers would publish their, their spread at what they sell it for versus what they buy it for you'll notice that the bid ask spread is also wider you'll notice that the premiums are also higher too i think i i remember at the conference talking to someone and they were saying they bought rhodium um, which, which is, uh, they bought it, for, I forget what they bought it for, but it, rhodium went up like a crazy amount. And they said they weren't even concerned about the bid ask spread or, or the premiums at that point because rhodium went up so much. But, you know, I would say that this is more of a speculation. If, if you're looking to protect your assets, I would say don't, don't go too crazy into any of these, these more niche metals. Yeah. I've never, I've never understood the point of them as, you know, for investors, it's just, it's too novelty like. You know, it's not like if you have ideas about, you know, gold being real money and so forth and silver having monetary value and all that, um, you know, it doesn't translate to rhodium, <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? Or palladium or platinum. You know, the the funny not. part is and we talked about the conference earlier. So we had a, a, probably about 30 or so of the top gold, silver and platinum products um, at our booth. And what was funny is we had a platinum eagle there. Obviously, that's by far the most popular platinum coin. No one asked about it. I don't even think people knew it was platinum because I guess the, the normal public does not you know, know the difference co- in between the color of, of silver and platinum. And you could tell it's, platinum is a little more like grayish purple um, tint than silver, but you know, no one even noticed it. So you, know, you get into some of these niche metals like, like rhodium or something. Would someone even recognize it if you had it? I wanted to ask you about something really weird. While we're covering all these topics, while I have you here, I need you as my, you know, my <laughs> reference on some of these things. I just want to run a lot of ideas by you and thank you for sort of letting me yeah, go pepper for you with different topics. So there was this um, thing back in May where Paul Krugman, the, the um, actually he Nobel laureate economist, why he won, I, I have no idea, but he wants to mint a trillion dollar platinum coin. And his idea was to avert the debt ceiling problem I mean, I don't, I like, I, I read the articles. I don't even understand what he thought he was thinking. I don't understand this at all. Do you? I mean, do you have any idea what this was about? No, no, I don't. And, and it's, it's just, it's crazy too, because if you, even if you look at the national debt, you're, you're 30 trillion. Um, and, and at least that, that's a public number too. Obviously you put un, unfunded liabilities in there. You're north of a hundred, hundred fifty trillion dollars. I think this is just just more, you know, just just nonsense too. It, it, I I think you get back to what we said is is you know you either you know you default, you print, or or, or you you balance the budget. And, and I don't think balancing a budget is going to happen too. Is is if you look at it, I think the last time we had a budget surplus was probably back around two thousand, and the national debt still increased. 
So it just it, the, the debt's going to only increase and increase. Um, I don't really think there's a way out of this. Um, so I think that the easiest, least painful way for the government is, is just to print. And eventually everyone, all the creditors get their, get paid back for, for what they're owed. But the question is, what's that dollar going to be worth at that time they get paid back? Okay, so here's the key part. This was actually, this idea is like back to 2014. And Krugman had an editorial that he wrote. And he says, um, there's a legal loophole allowing the Treasury to mint platinum coins in any denomination the Secretary chooses. Yes, it was intended to allow commemorative collector's items, but that's not what the letter of the law says. And by minting a $1 trillion coin, then depositing it at the Fed, the Treasury could acquire enough cash to sidestep the debt ceiling while doing no economic harm at all. If he thinks that would really do no economic harm, it's just an excuse to print a trillion dollars. I mean, at that point, the price of these metals we're talking about would go through the freaking roof. It's insane. Yeah, and, and I, I haven't looked into it in great detail too, but I'm just thinking if you had if if you had debt, right? And, and let's say, let's say that was that was your debt. You you lent the government money, and they said, "Oh, don't worry, I'll, we'll just get a platinum coin." And we'll, we'll, I mean, what happens with the debt? You still you still want to get paid back, and you still want to get paid back in real money. They can't just yep. say, "Oh, here you go, Dan. Here's a platinum coin, and that hundred thousand that you loaned the government. Oh, don't worry, you got a platinum coin." I was like, "I, I don't think it works that way." <laughs> I don't think so either. <sighs> All right. I guess it's fun to sort of cap off the interview with a little bit of, you know, Paul Krugman nonsense. But we've arrived at um, the moment we always arrive in our interviews when we ask our final question. You answered this once before. You might not remember. I hope you don't I, remember. I, I, I forgot. I, I know it's been a while Good. since I've been on your show. I always think these That's questions best. are fun and, and hopefully it doesn't throw <laughs> me a curveball. <laughs> no, it's the identical question. The, the same final question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-finance thing, I ask the same exact final question. So I'm glad you don't remember it because it works better that way. And the question is simply, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? Yeah, I would say check out. I mean, make sure you have an allocation into precious metals. I think that the the, the economy is in, in a tough bind right now. Um, there's a lot of things you need to be concerned about precious metals. Obviously, physical side, good. If you want physical, look out for your spot price. Look out for your premiums. Um, Atmex is a great way to, to buy it. Um, One Gold is also a great way to, to buy uh, precious metals, too. Currently, what I'm using to avoid low premiums, um, what it is, it's just basically an online investment account that you could uh, buy gold in a couple minutes, uh, buy gold, silver, and platinum in a couple minutes. But I would say make sure you have an allocation to it. Um, a lot of times, just even for new people, it's like they ask, how much should I get? Um, you know, start small. And if you think that's good, then great. If, if you want more that, or if you don't feel that's, that's the right allocation, get a little bit more. And someday you'll feel, you'll feel that you have the, the right allocation. But I, I think, you know, the dollar's in trouble. I, I think stocks might um, flatline for a while. We had a lost decade before. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to have a lost decade again just because they, they've they've went up so so much. But, you know, I personally think precious metals are going to be a, a good investment for the next several years. I agree. I don't think you can afford to be without them for the next several years, decade or so. Um, for similar reasons, too. I've been talking about the potential for a sideways market and, you know, exorbitant equity valuation. So we're, we're on the same page, which I promise you folks, I'm not just picking guests who agree with me. <laughs> uh, but listen, man, it's always good to talk to you. I'm, I'm glad that we ran into each other in Florida and I'm glad you could make time for us today. Great. Well, thanks again for having me on, Dan. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Many mainstream analysts are predicting that stocks will recover soon. But I say we'll instead witness a cash frenzy unlike we've experienced in 21 years before stocks recover. And I'm urging Americans not to buy a single stock until they see it. I predicted the Lehman Brothers crash in 2008, and I called the top of the NASDAQ in 2021. But this, this is the number one most important thing to pay attention to for 2023. And I'm not talking about another market crash or politics or inflation or any of these other things. As all this unfolds, the financial consequences of what I'm talking about could last for several decades if you don't understand what's happening. There will be winners and losers, and now is the time to decide which one you'll be. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about my warning totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together. 
Get the facts yourself. Go to www.stockdeadzone.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to get my four steps to prepare for what's coming. Again, that's www.stockdeadzone for a free copy of this new report. I think Patrick's final thought was really important. I think everyone should really seriously consider some kind of allocation to precious metals. And I also want to emphasize that there is a difference between holding the metal um, in a form that you can get access to and everything else, whether it's, you know, futures and, you know, if you're sophisticated enough to know about that, you don't need me talking to you about it. Futures or an ETF or anything else, or like, gold stocks and silver stocks, you know, the stocks of gold and silver mining companies to be quite precise. That is a very different bet than acquiring a stock of precious metals um, as part of your savings, as part of your long-term holdings that you use to preserve wealth, Uh, you know, over long periods of time. The prices are going to fluctuate, but over a long period of time, you will generally, I believe, still be very happy that you know, you, you managed to get some of your savings into gold and silver. I think that's, that's, that's the message. That's the takeaway. And of course, you know, I hope you took good notes. If not, you know, listen to the interview again, because he gave us some great ideas for how to think about the premiums that you pay when you buy these things and, and how to avoid them right now too. So please take advantage of all that. And, uh, you better believe we'll be checking in with Patrick again, um, sooner rather than later. He's a, he's our guy in the metals markets, you know, one of them at least. All right. Well, that's another interview and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, Tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com, please. And also, do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com. Or call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, until next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.